Support comes from St. Louis Public Library Foundation, helping the library serve children and their families with programs and services needed to become lifelong readers. More information about the foundation is at slpl.org. I'm Elaine Cha, and this is a special edition of St. Louis on the Air. This past Thursday, producer Danny Wisentowski joined our show to discuss how VP St. Louis has ousted the central figure and namesake of the secret society that runs St. Louis's 4th of July parade, the Veiled Prophet. STLPR's podcast, We Live Here, takes a deep dive on the history of the Veiled Prophet and explores how it's connected to the Ferguson Uprising. Here's my colleague, Chad Davis, with Episode 7 of We Live Here. Hey everyone, I'm Chad Davis. Now, if you've been sticking with us throughout this entire season, then you've been on plenty of journeys with us. I mean, we took you to the opening of a public park, inside a jail, even back to school. But right now, I want to take you on a different journey, one that's more of a celebratory one. I'm in downtown St. Louis, and it's the morning of July 4th, Independence Day. The streets around me are packed with people ready to take in all of the festivities. I mean, there are hundreds of performers, and they're making their final preparations. High school marching bands, dance troops, floats, muscle cars, even beauty queens. And they're all here for America's birthday parade. But I'm here to solve a mystery, a kind of missing persons case. We've arrived just in time to see the first few floats. These are the star of the show. There's one, a multi-leveled pirate ship that has actual cannons that blast candy at the crowd. I mean, the kids have been going crazy for that one. And later tonight, the sky above the Mississippi will explode with fireworks. If it all seems like a patriotic, family-friendly, out-of-season Mardi Gras, well, that's because it is. It's an incredible spectacle, and for generations, it's been attracting people here from all over the country. We drove out here from LA. It was a, uh, we took like a 24 hour, 24 hour drive. drive. Uh, we split it between like five days. I come here every year I'm from Kansas City uh, to come to see the parade. I heard about it, and we don't really know anyone here, so I just came and bought my grandkids so they can, you know, experience it. Just the excitement of it all, and the, the bands, and the floats, and the people, and just the unity of all the people enjoying this great parade in our beautiful city. Yes, there are the lavish floats and the sea of American flags that you'd expect from a 4th of July parade. But there is someone who isn't here. A mythical figure who for more than a century stood as a kind of mascot a figurehead for St. Louis's most powerful and wealthy. He was called the Veiled Prophet. And each year in St. Louis, he would appear before the public only once. Here, in fact, at his parade. Once upon a time, in a far, far away land of downtown St. Louis, the Veiled Prophet had his own float and a squad of costumed attendants on horseback. An entourage of young women surrounded him in colorful designer gowns, his maids of honor. He was dressed like a king in robes of white and purple, each layer adorned with jewels and sequins. On his head sat a golden crown. It was shaped like a big Hershey's kiss with angel's wings sticking out from the sides and a star above his forehead. His face, of course, was covered by a glittering veil. His identity? is hidden. So, where is he today? The logos plastered around us on the floats and banners along the parade route instead state that it is the 141st edition of America's Birthday Parade. The thing is, that's just not true. 141 years ago, it wasn't a parade for America's birthday. Heck, it wasn't even held on the 4th of July. The whole Independence Day parade tradition started in 1981. And back then, it still had the Veil Prophet's name. It was called the VP Fair. Some people still remember it that way. I consider it the VP Fair still. 
I don't think they should ever change the name. I think they should have kept it BP Bear. Beneath the surface of this parade and its name is a story about the pageantry of power and its downfall. It's about an exclusive shadowy group that spent most of its 144 years trying to keep its fantasy of an exclusively white, wealthy secret society alive. Despite being a mishmash of stereotypes, patriarchy, and 19th century racism, this group and its members have shaped the destiny of St. Louis. The Veil vale Prophet has thrived through world wars, civil rights protests, and political upheaval, all the way to today. But something happened here in the last 10 years, something which the Veiled vale Prophet wasn't prepared for. And that's why we're here at the parade. We're searching for the truth behind the veil, because the absence of this once famous figure is evidence of what an uprising can accomplish and the ways that power can change its shape in response. Because if we're trying to understand the legacy of something like the Ferguson Uprising 10 years later, we have to consider what it means for a protest movement to take on the city's wealthiest, most elite leaders, and win. This is We Live Here, 10 years after the Ferguson Uprising. Before he was a St. Louis civil rights legend, Percy Green was just another kid growing up in the 1940s and 50s. Each year in December, his parents took him to the Veiled Prophet Parade. Now in his 80s, Percy remembers what he loved about the parade as a kid. The free candy and the amazing floats pulled by teams of horses. The parade always ended the same way, with the Veiled Prophet himself flanked by his maids and his escort, his queen of love and beauty. As Percy got older, though, he started to notice other things. They had horses and everything, but they first started pulling the floats. Had men, black men, with the pooper scooper, picking up the, uh, the horse's uh, poop. That was something that kind of stood out, but uh, that was, you know, it, it was just pretty much ignored as far as the black community was concerned because that was just part of uh, the way it was then. We'll return to Percy Green in just a bit. He has a big part in this story. But his last point about the way it was then, about St. Louis and the golden age of the Veiled Prophet, we need to pause and talk a little bit about that because the story of the Veiled Prophet is different depending on who tells it. Take this version, for example. Our enchanted story begins in 1878, when a wise, benevolent Persian monarch began traveling the world in search of a suitable community to share his goodwill. One city, the gateway to the west, stood out above all others, and the veiled prophet of Khorasan selected the city of St. Louis as his adopted home. What you're hearing is a video produced by the Veil vale Prophet organization itself, part of a commemorative DVD given to attendees of the 2012 Veiled vale Prophet Ball, and which someone listed on eBay for $6. And that was $6 well spent, I might add, because this version, it tells us something about how this organization saw itself, how it told its story because this enchanting version of the story continues telling how the Veiled Prophet summoned the leaders of St. Louis. Together, he asked them to join in his mission in making St. Louis a better place and to conduct good deeds in secret on his behalf. The Prophet promised that each year he would return to St. Louis to throw the most wonderful parade for his new friends. And like any good fairy tale, it ended with a lavish ball. Following the parade, His Mysterious Majesty arrived at the Merchants' Exchange, located several hundred feet from where we gather this evening, where a grand ball was taking place in his honor. Upon his entrance, he selected one special young woman to accompany him for the first quadrille, or waltz. In the annals of St. Louis history, Susie Slayback would forever be known as the first veiled prophet, Belle of the Ball. The Veil Prophet is still a secret society in St. Louis, 
with exclusive all-male membership. It didn't allow black members or Jewish members until the late 1970s. But in many ways, even today, it operates the same way it did in 1878. Its survival isn't an accident. Even as the Ferguson uprising has changed so much about St. Louis in the past 10 years, the Veiled Prophet is a sign of what has stayed the same. Each year in December, the Society's members convene in a luxury hotel ballroom for the VP Ball. Nothing is known about the Prophet's identity or the men who voted for him. While the men of the Veiled Prophet operate inconspicuously, their daughters and their last names are put on display. Names like Schnook and Schlafly, Danforth, Bush, and Kemper. Names associated with the city's biggest industries, beer, baseball, and politics. Some of those daughters are chosen as that year's bell of the ball, called the Queen of Love and Beauty. So what is the Vale Prophet? Well, it's an exclusive club. It's a debutante ball. It's a parade. It's all these things. Yeah, this is a big, a big nest of conflicting symbology is like the best way to characterize the Veiled Prophet. Author and journalist Devin O'Shea has spent years studying the Veiled Prophet's strange history. And he makes a good point. The more you look at its history, the messier it gets. So if you're expecting a backstory that makes sense, you're going to be a little disappointed. So instead, I'm just going to hit you with some ridiculous history. But it's all true. The story of the Veiled Prophet starts with a poem called La La Rook, written in 1817 by Irish poet Thomas More. It features a villainous character, a despot from the Persian kingdom of Khorasan, and he was called the Veiled Prophet. And hey, the poem turned into a huge hit. In 1878, it got a major revival in St. Louis. That year, the Veiled Prophet Society was founded by two brothers, Alonzo and Charles Slayback. Alonzo was a former Confederate cavalry officer. Charles was a businessman who had become obsessed with the idea of bringing Mardi Gras to St. Louis. Together, they'd create a club that would exemplify exclusivity, class, and yes, throwing a big parade every year. Now, a successful secret society needs an identity, right? A brand like the Freemasons or Elks Lodge or Illuminati. It needs mystic rituals and arcane imagery. The Slaybacks simply borrowed them from a well-known poem, turning the villain into a benevolent Persian king who had fallen in love with St. Louis. And thus, the Veiled Prophet was born. That's the history. Now, this whole Veiled Prophet look the aesthetic of a Persian king of Khorasan, it's an example of Orientalism, which was hugely popular in the 1800s when poems like Lala Rook were a hit. It was like a genre of pop culture, often shaped for the racist appeal of an exotic Far East filled with turbans and flying carpets. Okay, but what did it mean to be a veiled prophet? You had to be a man, and white, and seriously wealthy to join the group. Membership meant privilege, not just for you, but for your family. Like Alonzo Slayback, it meant having his daughter declared the bell of the very first Veil Prophet Ball. Yay! A yearly gathering that in St. Louis quickly became the social event of the season. But in studying its history, Devin O'Shea argues that the Veiled Prophet Society was more than just a wealthy racist men's club that loved throwing fancy balls. A lot of uh, the historicism about the Veiled Prophet Society is like, this crazy thing came out of nowhere in 1878, and it was just a whole cloth celebration of St. Louis, and that completely obfuscates what happened the year before, which was one of the biggest crises in the city for the city fathers you could possibly imagine. Just one year before the Veiled Prophet's founding, St. Louis was shaken by the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, one of the largest strikes in American history. Black and white workers protested together in the streets and overthrew the city government. Committees of workers set up their own headquarters. Those in power weren't ready for this kind of uprising. They called it the St. Louis Commune. Yep, it involved communism. The strike was crushed after six days but it terrified those in power. And so we can also understand the Veiled Prophet Society as this sort of synthesizing 
um, you know, a healing effort for the city's elites who just got really shook by the railroad strike. So you can understand the sort of nervousness of them coming together then after that and saying, okay, we've got to put our war differences aside and concentrate on (laughs) oppressing the working class. It's quite the conspiracy. But if we judge solely on longevity, this absurd plan by the city's elites to use an Orientalist mascot to gather people for yearly parades instead of labor protests, it actually kind of worked. The parade was a huge hit. Thousands arrived by ferry and rail to see the floats and the Vale Prophet himself. Decades went by and America changed. In St. Louis, generations grew up watching broadcasts of the Vale Prophet Ball on television. This bizarre tradition became a part of regular life and not just the upper crust of white society. Doing the VP, I was just as naive, my parents were just as naive to some degree as all of the other black parents in the community. Even in, in terms of the school, the Ville Prophet early on was something that my parents wanted to uh, take the, the kids to see the parade. Percy Green grew up knowing the Ville Prophet through his parade, witnessing the racial contrast of the Ville Prophet's float. White people riding high in luxury with black people picking up the poop behind them. There were no black members of the Vail Prophet Society when Percy was a kid, watching the parade from the sidelines. That was the thing to do. It was a parade, and kids always liked to go to the parades to see the floats and whatnot. And then, of course, as, as I got older, then we went on our own, but we took our bean shooters. We then took our bean shooters, used to shoot uh, uh, beans over at the, at the floats and whatnot. We had them ducking and everything. We, we got a big kick out of seeing them, uh, uh, you know, ducking and, and, and doing that or whatnot, you know. But no one was ever arrested, uh, nothing like that, or, or injured. Percy wasn't satisfied with shooting beans. In 1964, he staged a daring protest by targeting what is now the symbol of St. Louis, the Gateway Arch. Using a construction ladder against the still unfinished North Leg, Percy climbed his way into history. Percy's fearlessness and arrest afterwards drew national attention to the fact that only white workers were hired to build the monument. It sparked a federal investigation and later, a landmark civil rights case that forced the National Park Service to end its racist hiring practices. Percy's next target wasn't as physically large as the Arch, but in 1960 St. Louis, the Veiled Prophet was its own kind of monument. Percy's protest against it was based in racism and also economics. He realized that the same people behind the Veiled Prophet Society were also the leaders of the region's largest employers, including utility companies which refused to hire or pay black people a fair wage. They are so locked into uh, this whole racist thing to the extent that they are robbing the black community of a a decent income or whatnot. And therefore, they are responsible for the the crime in the neighborhood and all of the other negativity that are occurring as a result of them uh, discriminating. Percy had founded the activist group Action to lead protests against the Veiled Prophet. He was arrested after handcuffing himself to a parade float. He even picketed the ball, but always from outside the hotel. And that got him thinking, what would it take to infiltrate the ball itself? What would it take to unmask the Veiled Prophet? All we had to do was to be able to get them in. And once they were in, then we knew that they could use the, 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 the appropriate ingenuity to try to, to get as close as possible to the VP. Percy couldn't do it alone. He tried contacting more than 100 debutantes, hoping to convince just one to assist with his plan. A few of them wrote back, only to reject him. But one allowed him to actually meet with her family in her parents' kitchen to make his case. Interesting enough, they didn't seem like they was hostile. I mean, after we went through, through the, the dialogue and explaining 
as to the connection and how this was affecting the black community. I mean, it seemed like there was a certain amount of understanding, but then they're saying, but uh, uh, we disagree. I think that this is just a, you all could protest another way. And so as a result of that is that, uh, hey, we didn't know what the, what the effects was going to be until, boom, all of a sudden in the mail, we had these, uh, these tickets. It turns out his letters had gotten through. Now, invitations to the Veiled Prophet Ball were in his hands. It was just that when we got the invitations, then it was a matter of how was it going to be executed. And I knew that uh, we had two of the best people who had had experience. The two were Gina Scott and Jane Sauer both white women and longtime members of Action who had cut their teeth in protests against the Vietnam War. This would be something much different. The night of the ball was December 23rd, 1972. Percy's undercover agents made their way inside, joining dozens of college-aged women, each one chosen because of who their father was, an esteemed member of the Veiled Prophet. One of the maids that year was 18-year-old college student Lucy Ferris. Her father was a local judge. I was a wasp, uh, like most of my friends, most of the young women who were presented at the Veiled Prophets. So, you know, we went to Sunday school and we learned about Moses and we learned about Jesus and we learned about the Veiled Prophet. Uh, That is to say, I didn't learn about it in Sunday school, but because he wore those long robes and seemed to be a sort of godlike figure, it really felt as though he belonged in that sort of divine pantheon somewhere. And he was very much part of what your identity was as a St. Louisan, as, and by that I actually mean as part of the community that determined the fate of St. Louis. For Lucy Ferris's family, the Veiled Prophet Ball was tradition. Her aunt had been selected as the Queen of Love and Beauty in 1931. Lucy knew she was not going to be the Queen of Love and Beauty like her aunt. Her family may have been ultra high class in the 1930s, but now her father was just regular high class. Not important enough, not rich enough. But she had an invitation to the ball, meaning she'd get to meet and bow to the Veiled Prophet. It was a moment she'd been waiting her entire life for. And then she received a letter sent by Percy Green. I knew that he was a a big leader in the civil rights movement in St. Louis. I knew that he was uh, one of a couple of people who had protested when the uh, when the arch was going up because of uh, hiring conditions for black men. And again, the way this was discussed in my home was a way that sort of vilified the protest and and made it seem as though he was standing in the way of the great progress of St. Louis. But I, I definitely knew who he was. Um, he was viewed by the people I knew and the people around me as a as a black radical. My family was racist. They, most of the people I knew were racist. So if there were black people, you know, throwing things at the parade or shooting peas or whatever, then, you know, that was just kind of what those people did. And one couldn't understand them because they were black people. So it, it, it you ignored it. Lucy didn't write back to Percy. But months later, on the night of the ball, she witnessed something impossible to ignore. She entered Kiel Auditorium feeling apprehensive. She was surrounded by wealth. And although her mother had given her money for a dress, she bought the wrong kind of dress, the ones with sleeves, meaning she couldn't wear the long, luxurious white gloves like the other maids. Then. She felt the distinct sensation of the weed brownie she had eaten finally kicking in. And I thought, oh, isn't this glorious? You know, this is this is really like being at a royal court, and the music was so uplifting and Debussy or I don't know what very romantic sounding music, and uh, and I really suddenly was into it, and and saw myself as a princess or at least a member of the court. This was this was where I belonged, and I think I probably had a big stoned grin on my face by then. And then suddenly there was a disturbance. Lucy looked up. 
I caught a glimpse of a woman flying down and looking kind of like Mary Poppins on her umbrella. And, um, and then she disappeared for a few seconds. And then she came up and knocked the veil off the Veil Prophet. It was Gina Scott. As Jane Sauer dropped leaflets as a distraction, Gina had gone from a balcony to an electrical cable above the stage. The Prophet never knew what hit him. His veil was grabbed and thrown to the floor. And I literally said, oh, because it was as if the balloon had popped. And there was the old man. And uh, there we were all looking ridiculous. It felt as though that entire world def deflated around me. What Lucy Ferris witnessed that night in 1972 changed her. It also changed the course of history. Gina Scott, Jane Sauer, and Percy Green had pulled off for St. Louis the protest of the century, exposing that year's veiled prophet as Tom K. Smith, an executive at the agriculture giant Monsanto. Decades later, the actions of those activists would inspire a new generation in a post-Ferguson world. And that's coming up next. Four months after the Ferguson uprising began, in December 2014, Keith Rose was at a meeting with other protesters. An organizer approached him with a message. There was a top secret mission, urgent. And so this person said, Keith, we need white people who can go grab a suit as quick as possible and get down to the hotel that the ball is in and just see what's going on because we have this opportunity to go and, you know, investigate. So Keith did just that. He grabbed a suit and asked a friend to pretend to be his date. He accepted the mission. This was an incredibly tense time in St. Louis. Only a month had passed since St. Louis County Prosecutor Bob McCulloch announced that Darren Wilson would not be indicted for killing Mike Brown. The grand jury's decision to clear Officer Darren Wilson sparked intense protests in St. Louis and riots in Ferguson. That was also why Keith was at the ball. There was an unsubstantiated rumor that Bob McCulloch himself was the Veld Prophet that year. Well, I never found out who the Veld Prophet was that night. I doubt that it was Bob McCulloch. But we, we found out so many things, it was actually really hard to keep straight. It was like going into layer upon layer of a different world. And I, it took me years to make sense of all of the things I saw that night. From the tiaras, to the, the gilding, to the white gloves and gowns. Everywhere you look, it's like a storybook idea of what wealth looks like in America. It was a different story than the one he'd experienced on the streets of Ferguson, of the grief and the anger, the nightly protest and arrest, the calls for justice, for fundamental change, to take back the streets chanting the name of another black teenager who would never get to grow up. Inside the ball, none of that existed. It might as well have been 1878 again. At a time when the entire country was looking to St. Louis for direction on how do we navigate and how do we heal racial inequality, there was our police chief, there was our mayor um, rubbing elbows with the people who have for centuries propped up that same system. In many ways, the Veiled Prophet Ball that Keith infiltrated in 2014 was virtually unchanged from what it was 100 years ago. Yes, there were Jewish and Black members, but there was a lot of that original Orientalism, especially from a group called the Bengal Lancers, a tradition that started in the 1930s. Made up of Veiled Prophet members, the Lancer costume includes big bushy beards, red vests, red sashes, and big black boots, a kind of British colonial military uniform. They play the part as the Royal Guard from Coruscant, the Prophet's vaguely Persian kingdom. They are something that I wouldn't have believed people still did in public, especially respected people did in public 
if I had not seen it myself. They're very clearly dressed in the closest they can get to brown face without actually putting brown paint on their face. And the fact that they still think that not only is this okay, but this is, you know, humorous, this is a joke, is really disturbing because the kind of people who do that generally are the sons of the titans of industry in St. Louis, and they're going to be running most of our corporations. Keith was getting acquainted with strangers, trying to assimilate into polite society. But he made a rookie mistake. So that first year, everyone just assumed I was a server, which I think really speaks to the class (laughs) difference there. Like, I thought I was wearing the best outfit you could, and they still thought I was beneath them. Uh, So people were just handing me their empty champagne flutes all night long. It worked really good as a cover, but it wasn't what I was going for. In the years after that, I started wearing white tie, bow tie, started um, renting tuxedos. And so I was certainly looking the part and doing my best to understand how the wasps of St. Louis speak. Keith would get a lot of chances to practice. See, he knew he wasn't the first person to go undercover at the ball. He had read about what Gina Scott, Jane Sauer, and Percy Green had done in 1972. That was his blueprint, and he admits that he had become kind of obsessed with it. He wanted to follow Percy's plan all the way to the end. I've always really admired Percy Green, who I consider to be, um, you know, a real uh, father of our movement. And there was always hopes that sometime maybe around the 50th anniversary of the 1973 unveiling of the prophet that there would be a similar action and so for years i and a couple friends would attend the ball annually to go in and see exactly what's happening so that when we decide to do that protest we would be more prepared so figuring out what security looks like how to get around the barricades how to get as close as possible to the build prophet how to make sure you're pulling off the right veil because there's about five people who wear veils, not just one. Not everyone was veiled. There was St. Louis Police Chief Sam Dotson in attendance just a few months after two other high-profile killings in St. Louis of Kajim Powell and Von Derrick Myers. Keith made sure to take a photo of Dotson surrounded by luxury. Protesters once again targeted the event, but this year, Keith says the battle lines had shifted I will say, even in the years following Ferguson, in the first five years, so few people in our community even really knew or understood what the Build Prophet was. It got to a point where every year for Halloween, I would dress up as the Build Prophet just so that I would have an excuse to tell strangers the crazy story of what we do here in St. Louis. And I will say, all of the people who I know who moved to St. Louis as adults or for college did not believe me. Keith Rose, of course, is not the first person to become obsessed with unveiling the Veiled Prophet. He's not the only one trying to get people to understand what a fancy costume party for rich people has to do with the people who run this region, its politics, its biggest industries, its systems of power. The same systems that Ferguson protesters mobilized against and that are still being fought over today. Jamala Rogers has seen this all before. She moved to St. Louis in the early 1970s and went on to found the Organization for Black Struggle. Her activism focused on police accountability. She started protesting police shootings of unarmed black teenagers in the 1980s, and she's continued to do so every decade since. Because the killings didn't stop. For her, what was going on in Ferguson in 2014 was both different and familiar. It wasn't just about individual white people. It was a system, a very insidious system, an interlocking, interconnected system that impacted almost every aspect of life. So economically, uh, socially, culturally, uh, legislatively, all of those were connected with the main point of uh, ensuring and protecting the pathology of white supremacy. The Veiled Prophet is a kind of perfect symbol for that system. It seems fitting that later in life, Jamala married Percy Green, the activist who challenged and unmasked the Veiled Prophet. Jamala and Percy are titans of St. Louis civil rights. 
it would take a whole other podcast to adequately cover their contributions to the region. When they sat down with us to talk about taking down the Veiled Prophet, they brought with them a very special book. It contains newspaper clippings from Percy's decades of activism. The book is called Why We Must Raise Hell. It's not just a title, it's an argument. That's why I say when folks ask me that question, I say that you have to disrupt. You have to disrupt, unfortunately. You have to force people out of the comfort zone. Now, they'll get angry at first, you know, but then they say, huh. And then if you keep uh, uh, doing it, uh, of course, that's how we think that we got to the conscience of the Veil Prophet people, to some of them, by being consistent. Consistent, because a learning is a slow process. But I, I think also the other thing, yeah. Percy, is the disruption is necessary to get people's attention. But if you don't have a strategy to say here, or a vision about here's what we're fighting for. So, you know, you really have to stay raising hell and well, you have to raise hell around a strategy. Well, that's the point. The strategy Percy Green pioneered in 1972, unveiling the Veiled Prophet, changed St. Louis. It also changed things for the Veiled Prophet Society, which for so many decades acted like it was untouchable. To see the impact of that strategy and what's happened in the last 10 years, all you have to do is look at the parade. What began as a Veiled Prophet parade every December became in 1981 as the VP Fair held on Independence Day. The name changed again in the mid-1990s, when you start to see the first references to a rebrand, Fair St. Louis. But official names can be deceiving. In 2014, just a month before protests erupted in Ferguson, the Fair St. Louis parade broadcast by local news channel Camo V sounded like this. Welcome to the 132nd annual Veiled Prophet Parade. This live broadcast is presented by Wells Fargo Advisors. The 2014 Veiled Prophet Parade carries on one of the city's proudest traditions. As one of the oldest in the country, today's parade celebrates decades of community service by the Veiled Prophet organization. Even though he was sharing the spotlight with Independence Day, the Veiled Prophet still reigned in St. Louis. Every year, he showed up at the parade. It felt like a message that this was still his city. Even Ferguson's uprising couldn't shake him from his perch. So, what changed? Why isn't the Veiled Prophet the star of his own parade anymore? Well, remember those young women, the maids of honor, the queens of love and beauty, presented in the spotlight based on how powerful and rich their fathers were? Well, they grew up, and for some of them, the Veiled Prophet became a problem, as encapsulated in this 2021 news report. This goes back 22 years in 1999. Ellie Kemper was 19 years old, and she was crowned the Queen and Love and Beauty at the Veiled Prophet or VP Ball. Now there's a social media firestorm around Kemper and the organization's history. Actress Ellie Kemper had become famous through her role on NBC's The Office and had starred in the Netflix comedy series Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. But before the fame, in 1999, Kemper was the Veiled Prophet's queen of love and beauty. When photos of her participation in the ball were posted online, the organization's history of exclusion and racism went viral with them. One tweet even called her a KKK princess, a reference to the visual similarity of the Prophet's veil to a KKK hood. Now, the Veil Prophet isn't a part of the Ku Klux Klan, but Kemper did apologize for participating in the ball, saying she had no idea about its history of being, quote, unquestionably racist, sexist, and elitist. But the tide had turned. By this point, the Veil Prophet and its parade had already undergone subtle changes. On the annual TV broadcast, the Veiled Prophet Parade became America's birthday parade, presented by the VP of St. Louis. Then, it evolved into America's Birthday Parade. 
For the first time in the organization's history, the Veiled Prophet himself was nowhere to be seen in the 2021 parade. And it made sense. As a brand, the Veiled Prophet was toxic. As beer heiress Trudy Bush Valentine found out one year later while running for Missouri's U.S. Senate seat. Like Kemper, photos emerged of her as queen of love and beauty. But she had attended the ball in 1977, a time before the Veiled Prophet accepted black people. And it didn't help her campaign. Trudy Bush Valentine was crowned queen of their whites only ball. She bowed to the Veiled Prophet, supported the ball for decades. Trudy can never represent us. Valentine, like Kemper, apologized, acknowledging that as a debutante at the Veil Prophet Ball, she failed to fully grasp the situation. But honestly, there's a little bit of an unfair kind of irony here. I mean, as young women, Valentine and Kemper had been elevated, not because of what they did, but because of who their fathers were and what they owned and who they controlled. And yet, the 19-year-olds were held to greater account for their roles than any of the Veiled Prophet's actual leaders, the titans of St. Louis industry and politics, or the founders like Alonzo Slayback, who wore his affection for the Confederacy proudly and openly until his death. Devin O'Shea spent years studying the Veiled Prophet and its strange hold on St. Louis. And now, though it has retreated, its legacy is still around us. The Veiled Prophet Society is the city fathers, right? They created St. Louis. They say they did. Uh, and that includes a bunch of the decisions that happened in the late 1930s to carve up downtown St. Louis and destroy big parts of your and I's history, right? They destroyed the riverfront. They destroyed the Chinatown. They knocked down Lynch's slave pen in order to build... Bush Stadium, they built the arch, they built the highways that ripped through Mill Creek Valley and tore apart St. Louis in a really um, damaging way. St. Louis is a place that wears the scars of its history, the depopulated stretches of its northern neighborhoods, the highways and parking lots where communities and people used to be. It took the civil rights movement and people like Percy Green to expose the economic wounds of racism and the discrimination and segregation that thrived in the decades afterwards. And for so long, there were the invisible wounds, things you couldn't see as easily. The distrust of police, the feelings of grief and anger over the always growing list of black people killed by law enforcement. Those wounds were exposed in 2014 when a new protest movement put us on a new path and inspired people like Keith Rose. See, Keith had read Percy Green's book, Why We Must Raise Hell. He knew what he had to do. Each year, he got dressed in the fanciest clothes he could find. He went into James Bond spy mode, gathering intel for the eventual unveiling of the Prophet. Keith attended the Veil Prophet Ball without an invite for years. I think we should never underestimate the power that inherently comes with being a white man in America. And that opens doors figuratively and literally. Additionally, the way the buildings are set up, if you go the day before and you start to understand how to get into different areas, you can. You can navigate different elevators uh, like a maze. I think some of the most success I've had is just sticking my elbow out for an older woman in a gown and letting her take it as I lead her through the door. And who's going to stop you there? But Keith was never able to replicate what Gina Scott did in 1972. Today, he's retired from undercover intrigue. In fact, his decision to talk with us about his activities on the record for the first time, it means that the dream of unveiling the Veiled Prophet is finally over. At least it is for him. Yeah, so having spent five years preparing for a protest that we never pulled off, uh, is frustrating because in the back of my mind, that's always something that I've wanted. Unveiling the Prophet is the holy grail of St. Louis activism, right up there with climbing the arch. And only someone like Percy Green can claim both. So the idea that I'm taking off my own mask now and uh, 
talking about all my attempts to get into the ball definitely eliminates my chance in the future. And that's fine. That sounds like a sad way to end Keith's story. But he'll tell you that's not how it works. Issues like the Veld Prophet, which are multi-generational, which are based in the centuries, not in the months, remind us that to be in the struggle is to be a lifelong fighter for social change. And so if you look at the lives of someone like Percy Green or Jamala Rogers, you can see decades. You can see decades of them calling for change and also them evolving with the times. So as the situation around them changes, so do the ways they approach our city. And I think as a young person, it's important for me to understand that this is, you know, this is not only not a sprint and not a marathon, this is really a relay race. And in the same way that power is being handed down from father to son in organizations like the Veiled Prophet, power is also being handed down from older generations of activists to younger activists. And we're picking up that mantle and keeping on the fight. Um, And I think that really is an important thing to understand, that we're not going to win even in this generation. And we have to be prepared for that. We Live Here reached out to the Veiled Prophet organization for comment. The group today operates under the name VP St. Louis. And in a statement, it confirmed that the Veiled Prophet figurehead was removed from the parade after 2019. And it's not just the parade. The organization revealed to us that in 2023, last year, the VP St. Louis Ball, for the first time in more than 140 years, didn't include the Veiled Prophet. No one bowed to his mysterious majesty. There was no grand entrance. It was just a ball. The decision to depose the Veil Prophet was part of what the group's statement calls a collective decision by its leadership. Part of, quote, broader efforts to modernize and focus on community engagement. The Lancers are still attending the ball, and at this year's parade, for the first time ever, none of the Bengal Lancers wore the traditional fake bushy beards. So they don't look that much like a racist caricature anymore. According to VP St. Louis, the Bengal Lancers are, quote, just guys who enjoy riding horses in the parade. Society has evolved significantly, the statement continues, just as we have. We encourage everyone to focus on the VP St. Louis of today and the future, rather than fixating on the past. Okay. Well, even though they come from very different motivations, VP St. Louis is engaged in the same struggle as the one Keith Rose talked about. It's the struggle for social change, for the power in a changing world to shape a city's destiny. Now, make no mistake, the group formerly known as the Veil Prophet Society has evolved, at least in some ways. It changed its name, moved its parade around the calendar. I mean, that's something. Credit where credit is due. But Percy Green wants people to keep raising hell. Because when folks stop fighting, stop protesting, well, that's what power is waiting for. That also goes for Ferguson. We've witnessed 10 years of changes, but those changes aren't set in stone. This struggle, this fight, it's still happening. In schools, courtrooms, police departments, and social media feeds. Debates that we thought were settled on the basis of black history are burning hot again. And the last few years have shown just how quickly the gains of the last generations can be dismantled. And that's the lesson that unites the Veiled Prophet and Ferguson. Because I believe the Prophet is still out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's somewhere out there in Coruscant, just waiting to return, ready to wear that veil once again. I'm Chad Davis. This is We Live Here, 10 years after the Ferguson Uprising. This episode
episode was produced by Danny Wisentowski and edited by Emily Woodbury. With production assistance from Chad Davis and Ella Kuziz, and audio mixing and podcast design by Greg Montanew. We received editorial guidance from Brian Heffernan. Chris Houston is our executive producer. Special thanks to Camille Stanley and Holly Edgel. Financial support for this episode comes from the River City Journalism Fund. Our theme music was inspired by Cassie Morgan and remixed by Mastermind. We Live Here is a production of St. Louis Public Radio in collaboration with the Midwest Newsroom. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Enjoying this season of We Live Here? Suggest us to a friend you think might like the podcast and leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help new people discover the show. And thanks. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill and Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts.